and it's 10 p.m. in Accra, 11 p.m. in Abuja, Nigeria, and from the news up here at Adesawe. My name is Alfred Okansi, and this is News at 10. We're live on 3FM 92.7, live all across the world on 3news.com. Let's just take a look at the news that made the headlines throughout the week. Difficult for investigative journalists to thrive. Panelists at the World Press Freedom Day are advocating for increased investment into investigative journalism by media owners as well as ensuring that journalists are properly insured for safety. Meanwhile, renowned investigative journalist Anas Arimio Anas has advised investigative journalists to collaborate effectively with other colleagues and agencies with the capacity to deal with other aspects of investigative work, including prosecution. Anas also wants journalists to take personal steps to protect themselves. We're we'll speaking at him as a panelist at the World Press Freedom Day. And some customers of ASN Financial Services say they're losing confidence in the central bank over its seeming loss of control over the system and the financial sector. The customers who have been investing with the company for some time now are angry over the delays by management of the savings and loans company to pay their hard-earned investments. And the Minister of Gender, Children and Social Protection, Otiko Afisa Jabba, is asking all media houses to employ services of sign language interpreters to enable the hearing impaired understand its news broadcast. Speaking at the launch of 50th anniversary of the Ghana National Association of Deaf in Accra, the, the sector minister said never again should persons with disability be discriminated against. It's all live here on TV3 and this is News at 10. We're live on 3FM 92.7. My name is Alfred Akansi. Let's settle for the big one. Our special prosecutor Martin Abinu is set to tackle his first major case. In March this year, Executive Secretary of the Chamber of Petroleum Consumers, COPEC, Dan Kanamoa, petitioned the special prosecutor uh, to investigate issues surrounding the sale of some 1.8 million barrels of crude oil by bulk oil storage and transportation company that's bossed to an alleged unlicensed oil marketing company, BB Energy. A response signed by the Special Prosecutor Martin Amido acknowledged receipt of the petition, adding it has been sent to the appropriate division for action. The letter also stated that once the composition of the core basic organs of the Office of the Special Prosecutor is completed, COPEX petition will be handled appropriately and promptly. The Managing Director of BOSS, Albert Obeng Boating, was also copied. I've been joined on the telephone by uh, Dan Karamo, he's Executive Secretary of the Chamber of Petroleum Consumers, Copa. Duncan, thank you for your time uh, uh, this evening. It's been almost two months and over since you petitioned the Special Prosecutor's Office uh, and your letter has been responded to. Now, are you ready to give further and better particulars as this response is asking for? Well, indeed. Let me say good evening to your viewers, Alfred. Uh, I would want to put on record that we have been ready since day one and uh, we will do the little, the most we can to get the special prosecutor every supporting document uh, he would need uh, to be able to probe into this matter. 
Uh, let me just take your listeners back to uh, a few of the things that uh, we are asking for investigations on. Right. We had indicated that BOSS had indeed sold 1.8 million barrels of Ghana's crude uh, away. And uh, we had also indicated that it was sold uh, at a Dongumi rate. We had indicated again uh, that the said crude was sold to an unlicensed uh, company. And then again, we had also indicated that uh, there could have been some losses occasioned uh, for the transaction, which uh, if we had gone by uh, the Public Asset Disposal Act, uh, we would have made a lot more as a country uh, than the sole negotiation that was entered into. Uh, of all that we raised, uh, you would realize that both have so far struggled uh, to argue away the numbers from 1.8 million. Uh, they argue that what they sold to BB Energy was 942,000. Absolutely. And you see, that, the, I, was, I was coming to that point because whatever you're saying right now, it's almost the same that you've been saying over the past two months in the various media interviews and the press conferences that you have addressed. I recall that after that press conference, you put out this uh, detail, which you're, you're repeating again. Uh, Boss came out to, to react to it and, in their view, uh, discounted some of the things that you said, uh, claiming that they are not true. For example, there's 1.8 million barrels you're talking about. They put out a 942,000 thereabout figure as against what you say. They also say that it is, it is international best practice. It's not wrong in the industry to sell uh, uh, this good and under $2, uh, which you say was a loss. I mean, with this kind of reaction that Boss has given to the number of things that you've raised, which is captured in the report or the, the, the letter you sent to the special prosecutor, is there anything beyond this that, that no. you're going to give to him? Uh, indeed. That is why I was trying to refresh memory. Uh, we had raised pertinent issues. Uh, Boss had come out also to put their defense, which unfortunately happened to have been a lot of lies uh, in the process. Well, uh, we had mentioned one point. Alfred, if I could just learn, mm. we had mentioned 1.8 million barrels as the stock available at four. The 1.8 million barrels, both insist that it sold 942,000 to BB Energy. The rest it traded off with another trader called AOD. We are insisting that we would need full disclosure on the deal with AOD, also that brings the numbers to 1.8 million. And so the document 1.8 is what we are relying on and not the 942 that they thought uh, uh, to just uh, wish away. Again, we have said that at the time they sold the crude, uh, international prices were quite indicative and instructive. Prices were on the rise, on the increase. It couldn't have been said anywhere that under any best practices, Ghana alone would sell uh, at the sort of uh, rate they sold for. And so we believe that uh, some underhand dealing had been location for which we want the special prosecutor to go into. We would again rely on documents that effect. Uh, documents that point to the fact that we could have sold for a lot more. Uh, we would be depending again on the Public Asset Disposal Act, which says that for you to sell anything belonging to the state, you must be able to publicize or publish or announce for all other interested parties uh, to get in there. There was a sole negotiation uh, with DB Energy, whatever informed the pricing, I'm sure the special procedure must be very interested in getting to the bottom of. So I have said, from day one, we have been very uh, ready with our documents. We have been ready uh, with our facts. We are not abandoning any single of the issues we put out there. Indeed, when we said they had sold crude, uh, we were hoping that they would come and say they hadn't sold anything. When we said they had sold at Donkomi, we're hoping that they would have come to say that they sold at even uh, Benchmark Plus. When we said they sold to an unlicensed company, we're hoping that they would have a better defense. But uh, from all the defenses put out publicly so far by BOSS, uh, we are not satisfied and we think that Mr. Amidou will be able to get to the bottom uh, of these issues and Ghanaians uh, will be clear in our minds for once if indeed people work in their own interest or in the interest of the state when they are given these positions. In the end, they will still be left with you and the special prosecutor, and indeed, Alfred Obeying, in this case, bossed as an institution 
uh, to get to the bottom of this matter clearly. Uh, the special prosecutor has indicated his commitment to ensure that this particular issue uh, the, the, is going to the, the right conclusion. Now, beyond what has been said, already you're still battling uh, an issue of defamation in the court. So you will be serving the special prosecutor's interest as against what the court is also demanding of you, right? Uh, indeed. <laughs> the issue before the court has got very little to do with uh, what is before the special prosecutor. The issue before the court has to do with threats uh, on my life, uh, which uh, has been reported as defamation, uh, I can assure you that our lawyers are up to, you know, every defense matter. Uh, what we are asking the special prosecutor to establish is uh, some grounds for corruption and illegality. Indeed, it has been well established and documented that the company was entered into that agreement with uh, in September was applying to the NPA in December for nine sentences, uh, which tells you that uh, some illegality had been location and for which uh, attempts were even made to rectify or correct the situation. And All so right. we are abandoning the substance of this case. We believe that whatever corrupt practices or underhand dealings that went on in the sale of uh, 1.8 million barrels Ghanaians deserve to know, okay. and we'll get to the, the Very well. with this Duncan, thank you uh, for your time this evening. He is the Executive Secretary of uh, COPEC, that's a, a th with the, the petroleum consumers, that's the Chamber of Petroleum Consumers, Duncan Amoa there. But let me just state also that uh, this particular response by the Special Prosecutors indicated its willingness to get to the bottom of this particular issue. We'll be following this very keenly to bring you a lot more detail subsequently. But we'll go for a quick breathe. We'll be back shortly with some more stories here on News of Tech News Day. Welcome back to News of 10. Now, issues of ethics have been mitigated by media ownership and funding, thus making it difficult for investigative journalism to thrive. Panelists at the World Press Freedom Day are advocating for increased investment into investigative journalism by media owners, as well as ensuring that journalists are properly insured for safety. Here's a report by Catherine Fimpoma. Investigative journalism is the heart of the journalism's ability to fulfill its mission of holding power to account. Those who wish to silence journalism first target investigative reporters. Day two of the World Press Freedom Conference in Accra focused on how best to enhance investigative reporting. Panelists bemoaned the lack of resources by media companies intent more on commercial gain. Head of Africa Desk, as the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, Will Fijibun, prescribed that journalists join international networks to collaborate in their investigations. When you know that you're dealing with a sensitive domestic situation, try to enter in some kind of contact with an international organisation so that if anything does go wrong, Ghanaian Secret Service knows that they'll also be hearing from a French journalist, a British journalist, an American journalist or a South African journalist, and that if they dare touch the local Ghanaian reporter, there'll be some global consequences. Head of West Africa BBC World Service, Oluwa Toyosi Ogunseye, suggests employers set aside some funds for investigative journalism while ensuring that reporters are properly insured. That's the beginning, and that's very lacking. And I'm going to be calling on media owners to ensure that we're ins ensuring the people we work with, apart from insurance, safety training. How many of us know what to do when we're kidnapped as journalists? How many of us know of um, the, the necessary um, training when we face difficult situations. Another thing is protective gear. How many media houses have protective gear for their journalists when they do um, dangerous assignments? It's, it's, it's a tax that only um, media owners and also activists in the journalism space can take on. She was, however, of the view that small efforts can yield big result stories. Most of the time we think that investigative journalism is about when the president goes to jail or the prime minister is picked up and that's fantastic but I think that 
investigative journalism, original journalism, or quality journalism is journalism that delivers impact. And I wouldn't want us to just measure impact by the number of people that go to jail or are prosecuted. I want us to measure impact by the number of lives our journalism affects positively. Former ad hoc attorney of Peru and board member of Transparency International, Jose Ugas, thinks it is best if journalists do not assume the role of advocacy or civil society groups. Participants called for a continued access to global resources to further strengthen the front of investigative journalism. Meanwhile, a renowned investigative journalist, Anas Aremeyao Anas, has advised investigative journalists to collaborate effectively with other colleagues and agencies with the capacity to deal with other aspects of investigative work, including prosecution. Anas also wants journalists to take personal steps to protect themselves. He was speaking at a pan as a panelist at the World Press Freedom Day. Oh, with those badges of exclusivity. I am not party to that. I think that if you're looking for a societal good and a general good, when it comes to a particular stage, you have to share that information with another body that has that capacity to deal with the issue. People may misinterpret it in any way. Oh, you are in bed with that institution. You are in bed with government. You are in bed with this and that. But all oh, my life, I've done collaborations with institutions, and I've seen that they are more effective. It doesn't mean that those institutions will not be criticized. Panelists at the parallel session on investigative journalism spoke about ethics and risk mitigation. Claudia Julieta Duke, a Colombian journalist and human rights defender, advised journalists to devise self-protection strategies. She also called for access to global resources to enhance investigative journalism. Other journalists shared their experiences on the situation in their countries. Thousands of journalists are in prison in Ethiopia now. Uh, there is uh, uh, a law, it's called the Anti-Terrorism Laws Proclamation for the last 11 years. So many journalists are languishing uh, in jail without uh, conviction. Press freedom is a major challenge in Nigeria. Uh, between last year and this year, we are reporting 37 violations, and this takes the whole stratum of physical attacks, imprisonment, and one death. Um, so pretty much things are really not uh, as uh, nice and as rosy as here in Ghana, but you know. So, but it's a work in progress. In Uganda, Investigative journalists are the most targeted by um, the regime or the state uh, because they uh, dig deep into maladministration, governance issues, corruption, and, um, uh, and democratic tendencies. And the main challenge in here, uh, or the threat that is posed mainly to them, is uh, infiltration. Many of them are being spied on by others. It is the hope of all stakeholders that suggestions raised here would go a long way in upholding press freedom across the world. Meanwhile, Anas Arimeyawanas wants the public to watch out for his latest expose. What is going to come is actually very explosive. It's going to have um, what you want to see. And um, it's just around, just come, come and you'll see. I can tell you that it's explosive enough and you're going to see the big men who lie to this country. We are, are going to see them fall. You can trust Anas Aramio Anas for such exposés yeah, in investigative journalism. But TV3's investigative team in December 2017 brought to viewers the inside story of activities of sex workers at a slam close to the Kwame Nkrumah interchange. This piece led to the Accra Metropolitan Assembly demolishing the slam days after it was aired. We bring you excerpts of the piece first aired on the 21st of December, 2017. The precinct of the Kwame Nkrumah interchange is one of the busiest commercial places of Accra, Ghana's capital. 
illegal activities including duping, drug merchandising and soliciting for sex are common. These activities are fueled by Islam, popularly inhabited by some commercial sex workers and suspected robbers. This area is not new to city authorities. The Accra Metropolitan Assembly demolished structures harboring these commercial sex workers and alleged robbers after the June 3, 2015 fire and flood disasters that claimed more than 150 lives. More than a thousand makeshift structures were pulled down. These workers are however back two years on. Risk business has started again and more active than it was. In fact, the population of people engaged in prostitution and other nefarious activities has increased. <laughs> Dominating what goes on here are young girls and women selling their bodies. For six months, the investigative team spent time with these young girls and women, and the activities are numerous. Our accounts indicate there are more than 1,500 scattered structures used as brothels. <music> 32-year-old Abina, a mother of one, practices prostitution here. She joined several others here after the man who impregnated her left her and the child. Apena has lived on selling her body for 10 years. She says it is a lucrative business, but she acknowledges the risk involved. Abena has benefited from the illegality. Her son, who is in senior high school, is catered for with what she gets here. She goes through a lot at night to raise money to care for her son. When business is good, she can serve 15 men, and when the night has been bad, she only gets five men. <laughs> There are rules for patrons. Every bout or round of sex is termed short when the patron or the man is not spending the night with the woman. The duration of this short period of sex, though called short, depends on when the man ejaculates. So a short option can last as long as the man has not ejaculated. And for all that, the charge here is 10 cities with the use of condom. But for 34-year-old Felicia, she charges 150 cities and a minimum of 30 cities. She told us she charges depend on the styles the customer requests. Oh, very interesting uh, revelations in, in that uh, expose there, that investigative piece uh, by TV3's investigative team. Actually, you can find this uh, online as well and get the full piece of it. But I want to say thank you very much for staying with us here on uh, News at 10. On behalf of the rest of the team, we're grateful. Stay with us as we get into Sports Unlimited. My name is Alfred Okonsi. Good evening.